Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our uh, April webinar for our administrator webinar series. We're very excited to have you on the call today and to join and share with us this morning. We do want to just remind you one more time that we do have some files available for download that will support your work today, as well as a reminder that we are on Twitter. You can see the hashtag on the slide there. We will also be um, communicating with people throughout the webinar today. So if you are one of the people that have called in with your office phone, please go ahead and mute your phone so we don't have any background for the rest of the participants. And we're going to go ahead here and get started. First, I want to introduce our group here. We are the Educator Evaluation here Unit here within the Office of Educator Excellence at Michigan Department of Education. Uh, Rebecca Emmerline is our unit manager. Michelle Imbernoni is an education consultant working with educator evaluations. Brian Lloyd is our consultant here focusing on student growth. He's in, on the call today. I am Joe Priest. I'm a consultant that works with the evaluations. We also have Marty Snitchin here with us. He is our educator supports network analyst. We um, at Michigan Department of Education help ensure that Michigan educators have the tools, training, and supports to deliver effective instruction and leadership for all Michigan students. We provide support to teachers, administrators, LEAs, public school academies, and intermediate school districts throughout our state around a number of fundamental issues. And today we'll be focusing on the very important work of observation, feedback, and critical conversations. So here's a quote for you to read and reflect on. People don't mind being challenged to do better if they know the request is coming from a caring heart. After reflecting on the statement about being challenged by a leader with a caring heart, please share your thoughts about the quote from Blanchard with your colleagues using the chat pod on the right. Thank you for your thoughtful responses there. Um, continue to keep responding as well as to review the responses of your peers on the line today. Have some really insightful thoughts there about the importance of relationships and using those relationships to leverage improvement and growth and really that connection that helps uh, us all work together in school so well. It's really an honor for us to host this webinar for the administrator group that's on the call today throughout the state. Uh, we really appreciate you taking time out of your day to engage in this important work. We're very proud and excited to share this content with you and to support your professional practices as you engage in supporting the professional growth of others. 
It's our goal to provide you with some best practices and some current information and guidance that will lead the way to not only your professional growth with respect to the evaluation process, but also during the educator evaluation cycles of continuous improvement. During our webinar today, we'll, we would like to encourage your participation. We'll have some more poll questions for group response, but please also notice we have a question and answer pod to post any questions that you may have through the course of the webinar. We'll attempt to answer as many of those questions during a live webinar as possible. And also, following the webinar, you can expect to receive an expanded question and answer document with extended answers to the questions that were generated from the participants today. Also, after the webinar, we'll send out via email the presentation slide deck and a link to the recording of this webinar. And participants on the call today are eligible for sketch credits after you've attended at least three live webinars in the series. To obtain that sketch credit, you'll have to respond to the survey link that we present to you at the end of this webinar and we'll also provide via email. You have to respond to that survey with your PIC number included and then you'll receive the standard sketch email from the MOEX system following the conclusion of the webinar series. And of course, we understand that the participants on today's webinar are all working with different approved uh, evaluation tools and that each of those frameworks has different processes. So we're going to provide some guidance today that is vendor agnostic, not specific to any framework, but instead just full of best practices that could be brought into any of the frameworks. And again, just thank you again for joining us today. So all of our work here at MDE works, uh, focuses on our top 10 and 10 strategic goal. Our effort here really focuses on strategic goal number three, which talks about the Office of Educator Excellence role to assist our constituents with their educator evaluation systems so that they can move beyond compliance required by legislation, but also so that they might be able to exceed those requirements and truly leverage these systems to improve the professional practices and the student outcomes in an authentic way in your system. Michigan Department of Education believes that high quality educator evaluations can support student learning and can also support educator well-being. High quality edu evaluations can provide the teachers or the administration administrators under your responsibility with important and critical feedback on how they can improve their own practice to impact students' lives. In addition to facilitating educator, educators' personal pursuits of ex excellence, improvements to educator evaluations in schools and districts play an essential role in providing targeted professional development and learning opportunities responsive to the needs of the educators. As we, look, <clears throat> excuse me, as we look at areas of focus today, know that we will be helping you get organized for your end of cycle conversations. We'll also be prioritizing data as a means to grow the educator in preparing for end of cycle conversations. We'll share some Michigan teacher and administrator perception data from some research studies that we've done around educator evaluations in our state. And we'll provide some updates on educator evaluation and certification. Go ahead and participate in our next poll question, which is to please share out what methods you employ in preparing for your end of cycle evaluations to make sure that members of your staff are ready for those meaningful conversations about teaching and learning. Go ahead and take a moment to reflect and respond to that poll question.
Thank you so much for your thoughtful responses to that uh, question. This is Michelle, everyone, and again, thank you for joining us this morning. We're going to continue on, and please, if you have not had an opportunity to look over those thoughtful responses to that question, please go ahead and do so and take a look at what your colleagues are saying about that. We're going to continue on with our end of cycle uh, evaluation conversations and how we can prepare. For those of you who may have uh, uh, been a part of our conversations when we talked about uh, Ken Marshall and what he had to say about uh, beginning some uh, conversations with our teachers, he went into classrooms and done some mini observations and he was very specific and intentional with those mini observations and was looking for some specific pieces and he used the acronym SOTEL and I'd like to talk to you a little bit this morning about using that acronym and getting ready for those summative evaluation conversations using that acronym and being able to crosswalk that with your current evaluation tool. Educator evaluation for teachers and administrators, as you know, is a critical component for ongoing professional growth. When done with fidelity, in conjunction with your district's framework, it has the power to improve your performance to improve the performance of, evaluate, excuse me, of educators, thus ultimately impacting student achievement. It is our strongest leverage to improve learning, and it is to improve teaching through instructional practices. So how can educators do this? It is through the use of high quality, consistent, and effective feedback and evaluation, along with reflection and intentional practice that has the power to, and platform for professional improvement. So we've discussed this acronym as proposed by Kim Marshall in Rethinking Teacher Supervision and Evaluation and How to Work Smart, Build Collaboration, and Close the Achievement Gap for Administrators to Use when Conducting Many Observations. Using that same acronym in conjunction with your preparation routine for your summative evaluation conversations, we've devised a summative com conference document form which provides you an opportunity to review the five areas according to the Marshall uh, use to align with your evaluation tool. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at that document now. And as we go ahead and pull up that document, you'll notice when we take a look at using the acronym SOTEL, we've also been able to crosswalk the summative conference form and align it with the standards and domains that you typically would see in an evaluation tool and noticing that we have the elements of good teaching according to Marshall and also noting the rationale or evidence and the feedback that you may have provided previously during those mini observations or an evaluation and continuing to crosswalk that piece or that document. You'll also notice that there on that document are some areas that you may have indicated uh, or had the teacher demonstrated noting that there are the efficacy ratings of minimally effective, ineffective, effective, and highly effective. And remember that in this conference or this summative conference form, this is a piece of that opportunity for you to provide that feedback and noting this piece as you continue to move on. Understanding, of course, that this is just another document that you'll be able to use for reflection and to note your um, ideas and conversation point as you move uh, the process on with your teachers. And we're going to go back to the PowerPoint at this point. As we continue with our presentation, we're going to go ahead and take a look at opportunities to engage in high leverage feedback within the evaluation cycle. And our continuous learning opportunity begins with the teacher's opportunity for self-assessment and whether or not as an administrator you were able to provide any feedback in that process. And if so, what kind of feedback did you provide from one year to the next? How did that uh, teacher or that educator uh, move from one year to the next? Taking a look at their analysis or goal setting and their plan development, what supports did you offer to help that educator meet their established goals? Taking a look at their uh, implementation of the plan, what high impact feedback did you provide to inform the educator's daily practice? Moving forward on the formative assessment or the evaluation, after some observations and review of the data, what high impact conversations around professional development did you engage in 
and offer support around and the practice and goal of progress? Did you recommend any mid-course alterations and moving forward on the summative evaluation piece? When we focus on the evaluation cycle as a tool for continuous learning and improvement, we're able to uncover the opportunities for administrators to engage in this manner of high leverage feedback conversations around and opportunities to work with our educators to assist in growing their professional capacity throughout the continuous learning cycle. The questions on the slide are intended to guide educators in meeting with their, evalu with their educators in thinking about how to connect the process of educator evaluation with the continuum of professional learning. When meeting with our educators, some of the questions we should ask them is, did the professional development help you attain your goals? We should also consider asking them, what would you still like to know more about? And again, the five-step evaluation cycle of continuous improvement this piece of learning comes from the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. And although this is a vendor agnostic five-step cycle of continuous improvement, we want to make sure that our goal is to always move the educator forward in their professional growth goals. And although we want to make sure that we um, are moving forward, we definitely want to engage in those high leverage conversations and constantly be doing some high leverage conversations around feedback and in growing them. And if not, we need to step in early, make some of those adjustment plans, and engage in those conversations so that we step in early and we review that data with the uh, educator. And Joe's going to talk a little bit more about the data piece in just a minute. When we take a look at some of these pieces, there are four uh, specific steps that we want to engage in. And we want to take a look at sufficient evidence meaning the readiness. It requires being prepared to have a meaningful conversation. It is necessary to have a, it is not necessary to have evidence for every indicator or standard within the framework that you've adopted within your district. That would be merely impossible. But it is important to have clear expectations and a concise understanding with every educator on what it is you are looking for. In addition, both the educator and the administrator need to have sufficient conversations and clear expectations in a discussion prior to having that um, uh, conference. For evaluators, this should include feedback based on observations of practice both in and out of the classroom. The evidence should include both benchmark data on goals and evidence of practice related to the standards and indicators and areas directly tied to the established goals or to their growth plans. There needs to be an active pursuit of goals. Prior to a formative review, educators should have already engaged in some activities identified on their plan or their goal to support attainment of them. Given the logistics of timing of professional development, this can actually be a challenge. Understandably, educator plans should be written to ensure that these activities can take place prior to the mid-cycle uh, moment within their plans. There needs to be a shared vision of effective practice. This ongoing conversation noted as a priority and reinforced throughout team collaboration activities is an important element in the professional growth process. Educators and evaluate, evaluators will be well served by having some commonality in their goals or planned activities when adjustments are appropriate. Align to summative assessments used for student growth goals. Summative evaluation. Evaluators are able to analyze evidence that demonstrates the evaluator's performance against standards, as well as evidence of goals attained in student growth to arrive at an overall performance rating of either highly effective, effective, minimally effective, or ineffective. We're going to move forward, and I'd like you to look, take a look at this question. Reflecting on your own staff members, please share with your colleagues the areas that you spend the most time coaching your staff in. Would this be in the area of sufficient evidence, active pursuit of goals, creating a shared vision of effective practice, or plan for assigning of ratings? Again, you're going to be using that chat pod.
thank you again for your high degree of engagement. And as you take a look at what your colleagues have shared out, we do notice a shared vision for effective practice. But we also notice that um, many of you need to provide an opportunity to uh, really talk about the active pursuit of goals and making sure that your staff um, understands the uh, assignment or the plan for assigning ratings. So as we look ahead for uh, and begin our end of cycle conversations around planning for the assignment of ratings, the process of assigning summative evaluation ratings is both an art and a science. The science of evaluation is in the collection of evidence and the data that capture an accurate sample of an educator's performance. The art of evaluation comes when ed evaluators apply their professional judgment to the evidence before them in order to assign performance ratings. We're back with you here. Let's talk about the importance of data to drive your continuous improvement cycle for educator evaluation. Measurements of student learning growth and achievement are, are part of the summative performance rating. As we look ahead to the 2018-19 school year, 40% of the overall teacher evaluation is required by legislation to be based on student growth outcomes. 20% of the overall evaluation is required to be based on outcomes from MSTEP data for grades 4 through 8 ELA and math. Those are the teachers that have state testing data available. All districts and public school academies in the state must then decide the assessment source for measuring student growth. Using local assessment data creates an opportunity for teacher autonomy and decision making in the measurement of student growth for their evaluation. These measures can and should go beyond traditional standardized year-end assessments and include things like performance assessments, capstone projects, or interim and unit assessments. It all depends on what the LEA really seeks to measure. For example, a math teacher might include unit assessment trend data in their evidence professional portfolio to demonstrate student growth related to specific math concepts while a counselor might incorporate attendance rates and college application rates in their evaluation portfolio. Multiple measures of student learning, growth, and achievement must be comparable across similarly situated educators and must include state assessment data when available, as well as district determined measures. The bottom line here is that your district decisions can really support teacher autonomy in this process. So our question for you is what conversations can you engage in that will allow teachers to be in the driver's seat for this process. As an evaluating administrator, you should suggest to your staff that they should use data sources that help them explain what's the story behind their numbers. The incorporation of artifacts and measures of student learning provides educators with a unique opportunity to frame the nature of their evaluation, to use this evidence to tell a story of their professional growth and student learning. Districts will have the option to select the measurements used for student growth measurement. Quite often, the first question that's generated as we work with district teams on student growth models is, what assessments should we use for educator evaluation? So we have some information here um, referring back to our Northern Michigan University survey to help give a clearer picture of what the current practice is, as well as some options that are already in use. We really believe that PLCs or PLTs can go a long way into diving into these assessment questions and really making these decisions. But now is the perfect time to do a quick progress monitoring check-in to ensure that all of your staff members are on the same page using assessments before your end of year conferences are scheduled. So as we look at the survey responses from um, over 1,700 Michigan public school educators, we can see that a large number of um, teachers and districts in our state use um, national uh, assessments like NWEA to help inform their educator evaluations, while another large group of districts and teachers use pre-post assessments, as well as some other assessment types there that you can see on the slide. Um, we're going to provide a link for you later so you can uh, get linked to this full research site uh, and see the research projects um, and really inform about what's going on and what options there are for you for your use of assessments for educator evaluation. 
And we acknowledge that student growth may be the portion of the evaluation that creates the most confusion out there and the most anxiety for teachers. But when we keep in mind that the main purpose of this whole evaluation system is to really improve educator practice and to acknowledge the growth in student outcomes, we can approach this element of the evaluation with more thoughtfulness and less fear. And just a reminder that the multiple measures that are included of, uh, on the evaluation um, are supposed to be research-based growth measures. They can be alternative assessments that are rigorous and comparable. They can be nationally normed or locally adopted assessments. You can use a process like the student learning objectives to set academic goals and select assessments for your staff. And also the achievement of individual education program, IEP goals, can also be a measure for educator evaluation. So let's talk briefly about some other categories of evidence that can be included within educator evaluation. We offer a companion offering to this webinar series that's focused on teachers and teacher ownership of this process. We discuss evidence sources and collect collection methods, methods in depth with a, in a previous webinar for our teacher group. We do offer these recorded webinars on our MDE Educator Evaluation website, and we suggest that these uh, sessions can be professional development, professional learning opportunities for your staff members, and it can be provided to them in preparation for your end of year um, cycle conferences. So let's just do a quick review of evidence sources to, that can support an educator's preparation and reflective practices. The first category of evidence involves judgment based on products of practice, like artifacts related to the educator's practice, observations of practice. Both sources of these both both of these sources of evidence should yield information related to the educator's practice within the evaluation framework standards and connected back to their educator goals for professional growth and development. The artifacts collected um, can provide, uh, could include anything from team developed curriculum units to lesson plans to parent teacher communication logs. And when we advise teachers, we always say that the artifacts that should always be products of an educator's work that demonstrate the knowledge and skills of the educators. In other words, artifacts should be naturally occurring products related to the day-to-day -day work of instruction and never be manufactured solely for evaluation purposes. Both educators and evaluators share responsibility in the collection of relevant artifacts. The short, unannounced observations in the classroom, accompanied by timely, targeted feedback from you and other administra administrators, as well as longer, announced observations with feedback, all fall in this category, this first category of evidence. Of course, supervisors are primarily responsible for collecting and, and sharing this feedback. As we look at the second category of evidence, the measurements of student le learning, growth, and achievement, we know that those inform the summative performance rating as, as well. Educators can use multiple measures of student learning, growth, and achievement to demonstrate their effectiveness and to show progress towards their student learning goals. The content on this slide comes from the Michigan Model Arts Instruction and Assessment Project which is a collaborative effort between Michigan Arts Educators and the Michigan Assessment Consortium. Maya helps K-12 schools assess and improve student learning, support teachers, and enhance arts education programs in Michigan. In addition to developing assessments for teacher use, Maya recommends these steps to help educators present evidence to their evaluator to demonstrate their effective practice. So teachers should provide a summary of the student achievement information they can also provide samples of student work, and also to use student and teacher reflections as, a, as another source of evidence of student growth. In addition to the assessment information, educators may have additional evidence of student learning and achievement. This related data may be of value in providing a broader picture of student performance and teacher effectiveness. The goal of such evidence sources for educator evaluation should, again, primarily focus on that educator's practice. As an evaluator of a teacher in performing or visual arts or any other non-core areas, sharing this information developed by Maya with your teachers in these areas will provide a great conversation to grow achievement and strengthen student performance. Please note that we've provided some resources available for download today to support teachers' reflection and evidence collection to support your summative evaluation process.
Reflecting on your own staff members, please share with your colleagues how you can better support and encourage the gathering of products of practice, measures of student learning, and other evidence related to standards of practice, including staff and survey data. Please reflect on that and respond in our, in our chat pod. Thank you so much again for your opportunity to provide comment and feedback on that last question. 
And again, if you haven't had an opportunity to review the information that your colleagues have provided, please go ahead and do that now. And just as a reminder, we will go ahead and provide that in our follow-up email with, of course, all the documents that we have provided today. And we will put that, uh, those responses in our FAQs when we email that out to you. We're going to continue on with uh, gathering your resources at this point. As you gather your resources for review with your educator, you need to be sure that you have all the up-to-date data and information to move the process forward effectively and efficiently. Regarding the data, have you had a chance to review with the educator the most up-to-date information and pieces sufficiently? Have you utilized the framework and the tool effectively to promote and foster the professional growth of the teacher? As noted here, local resources will support your reflection and planning for the end of the evaluation cycle and start of the next cycle, which is just around the corner. The start of the next cycle begins with the ending of your end of cycle conversations and establishing the goals for the next school year. As part of your practices, be sure to review the alignment of existing or planned professional learning initiatives, individual and team goals, and school and district goals and priorities that impact those activities and the individual educator and how those activities are in, have impacted the instructional strategies that have been used within the classroom. You need to be sure that you have scheduled times of the summative conferences with enough advance notice to allow both the educator and yourself to properly prepare. As this slide outlines some action steps to prepare for the summative evaluation, these steps vary in scope. Some are the responsibility of you, the evaluator, and some are the responsibility of the educator or the teacher that you'll be meeting with. Some are more collaborative in nature. This is an important list to review. Many of you will find that these list items have already been communicated and clarified. For first-time evaluators, this may be an opportunity to create another point of clarification and just merely serve as a quick checklist. Please make sure that you communicate clearly the purpose of the meeting and how the teacher is to prepare and the expected outcomes of the discussion. You need to be explicit about how much documentation or evidence that the teacher is expected to bring or the conference and when to prepare and provide the evidence for you. <coughs> be sure to analyze the collected evidence chronologically, looking for patterns and trends over time within or across the standards or indicators, if that is how you want that to be collected. You need an opportunity to review your notes and feedback that you have provided. These formative assessments provide additional evidence of feedback for you to uh, review and an opportunity for a response uh, that the teacher has given you. You need to make sure that you are up to date on those responses and provide any additional feedback. You also need to make sure that you have provided um, feedback on any adjustments that the teacher has made with regard to lesson plans or the feedback that you have given them. You also need to share the data that demonstrates a positive effect on student learning from those changes that the teacher has implemented. Feedback should be seen as an opportunity to coach each and every teacher or the administrators that you are responsible for and working with. To do this and to do it well, you need a different strategy to coach each individual teacher and or administrator so that you can impact and improve student learning and student achievement. Regular, consistent, and high-impact feedback and time to improve their craft is necessary for a teacher and administrator to grow professionally. To move from effective to highly effective, or from highly effective to what some would consider a master teacher, or highly effective school-ready or district-ready principal, which is the idea that principals or assistant principals or school leaders are in prime positions and ready to serve their school communities by reaching out to their colleagues and bringing them into the fold to serve in other ways is necessary. So we need to provide that uh, information to them and ready to move on um, so that they can better serve their communities. And that takes us to our ne next reflect and respond question. And for those of you who have been with us during this series, you'll remember seeing this school-ready quote on school-ready principles from CCSSO. 
and I'll leave you to read this and to respond on this. Again, thank you for your feedback, and uh, we will be moving forward with the uh, presentation. Thank you again for your engagement on school-ready principles. Moving forward, we're going to continue with maintaining high levels of sustainability, and we're going to talk about the summative evaluation piece. After all, that's what we're gearing up for at this point in the school year. As you know, the, it is the final step of the cycle, and the summative is the summative evaluation. It is the final evaluation step where evaluators analyze the evidence that demonstrates the educator's performance against performance standards to arrive at the rating on each standard. And an overall performance rating is based on the evaluator's professional judgment, which we've spoken about. Evidence and professional judgment inform the evaluator's determination. The process is similar to that of a formative assessment for the mid-year review. Evaluators review and analyze the evidence gather additional evidence and insights from the educator, and issue performance ratings on each standard as well as an overall rating. Because the summative evaluation completes a full evaluation cycle, the value and meaning behind this step does not lie in the end of one cycle, but in the beginning of the next. A thoughtful summative evaluation identifies trends and patterns in performance and offers feedback for improving providing educators with valuable information that strengthens the self-reflection and analysis educators engage in as they continue through the improvement cycle with self-assessment and goal proposal, guiding plan development for the subsequent cycle. And this is a reminder from us to you, the evaluators, regarding efficacious evaluation systems and how they can pos positively impact student outcomes. 
as you'll remember, classroom teachers have the greatest impact on any system controlled factor on student achievement. Right after that, our school administrators with 25%. Imagine that, a system that is designed to feed and nurture and grow professionals from prior to entry into the profession until the very last day upon retirement, understanding that capacity on the professional continuum where we positively impact the profession throughout the system when evaluation is approached as something that is done with, hand in hand, the evaluatee and not to the evaluatee, how that capacity can grow. That is what we are hoping for here at MDE. And just a reminder that the whole point and purpose of educator evaluation is really very targeted to improve student achievement, to improve in the use of skills and strategies by that educator, remembering that our goal is to provide authentic feedback, to engage in dialogue and conversation throughout that continuous improvement cycle. Again, effective evaluation systems should be implemented with fidelity, using research and evidence-based instruments, and again, the whole approach is to improve student achievement. And again, there's that quote there that I'll leave you with a moment or two to read on your own. In, during Joe's presentation on data, we went over the fact that under current law, student growth will be 40% for the 18-19 school year. Please share out how your teachers and or administrators are dealing with this shift in evaluation change. Include what you have done to better prepare your staff or administrative team for this growth mindset. Thank you. Please continue to respond and read the responses of your peers. We're going to push ahead to get through our last few slides here as we approach the end of our webinar. Our last few slides here are really some um, moments that we're capturing from our educator evaluation research studies. 
This first one comes from the Marzano Research Company, and they surveyed Michigan educators. The inquiry looked into the implementation levels of different elements of educator evaluations. From this table, you can see that there's been a strong emphasis on the implementation of feedback and student growth systems. While well, also noticing towards the bottom of the slide, the less implemented areas like professional development around educator evaluation and weighting the components for summative rating. And again, the reason we share some of this information with you is so that you can grow your awareness of the perceptions of educator evaluation and implementation across the state and also point you back to these great research projects that we have publicly available to inform your work at your local level. So again, um, some more outcomes from those research projects. Marzano Research, after their initial survey, then they followed up with some um, districts on a more up, up, uh, in-depth um, case study report where they really worked closely with those case study districts to really dig into their implementation. And ultimately, what they defined were some uh, barriers and challenges that were common across those um, uh, case study districts. And a primary challenge across the districts and PSAs that participated involved the limited time for, for the evaluators to conduct classroom observations, especially in small districts where principals may have the sole responsibility for teacher evaluations. At some sites, district and school administrators or district curriculum directors also are responsible for providing training on the educator evaluation systems. Stakeholders across the states pointed out the need for evaluators to be highly skilled at observing different classroom activities and rating elements of complex evaluation rubrics during the relatively brief classroom observation sessions. Districts also reported um, some additional barriers, some common ones that came across from our case study districts as barriers to implementation, including the variations in the quality and utility of evaluation feedback, so the challenge with adapting the evaluation systems for special student populations and content areas, as well as still some uncertainty around the approaches to integrating student growth into the educator evaluation systems. This slide really breaks down the barriers identified by different stakeholder groups. If you look at the far left of the slide, that's the um, barriers that were identified by teachers weighted. And so the one at the top is the highest weighted average barrier that was um, identified, which is different, the difference in evaluation skills among evaluators. Teachers also identified some barriers as requiring um, to have student growth measures into the evaluation, time to refill, fulfill all the requirements, the usefulness of the outcomes, as well as the degree of implementation. When the administrators were the evaluators, they identified the following barriers. The time, the requirement to include student growth measures, the requirement that all educators have an eva annual evaluation, the number of observations that were expected to be conducted for each teacher, and ultimately the rating system was identified as a barrier. When the administrators were the evaluatees, they identified these barriers. Again, the time to fulfill the evaluation requirements. The training on the model was identified as a barrier. The degree of implementation, as well as the usefulness and the idea, of, again, the requirement that all educators need to be annually evaluated. So we have developed some great resources to support your implementation and help to break down some of these challenging barriers that are um, within our educator evaluation systems. We house all those on our MDE at eval site. The, the quick link's at the bottom of the page there. Please click on that and bookmark this site as you know it has valuable resources to support your work. Again, more info about those resources available. On the far left-hand side, you can see some um, information about general uh, educator evaluation related information. The first three things are kind of overview information. Um, the next uh, three, educator workforce research, teacher turnover, and trends and certification are research um, papers and studies to give you an idea of, of the current trends in our state. The middle section of this page really is guidance around student learning objectives. We also have a great workshop um, opportunity this summer, so watch your superintendent eblast for more info and updates about a uh, workshop that we'll be pre presenting around student learning objectives to measure student growth for educator evaluation. And we also have a fair amount of guidance and documents on the right hand of this slide, slide around the student growth percentiles, the SGPs that will be provided from um, the MSTEP 
assessment for the teachers um, that are in those tested grades and subjects. So as, again, it was really our pleasure to share with you today. We hope that you found the content informative, and we, we encourage you to contact us further to support your efforts with educator evaluations. We do have a survey link on this slide to provide feedback on today's webinar and get you connected to that sketch process. And also, please keep an eye on your email, so we will be sending out a follow-up with um, a recording of today's presentation, along with our PDF of our slide deck, an expanded question and answer document, and, and we'll provide all these great responses that the group has come up with in our chats, as well as we'll resend out that link to the feedback survey. And we really look forward to having you again on our call for our next webinar in May. Here's a list of some of the sources and resources that we use to develop the content for today. And we just want to thank you one more time for carving out some time of your day to join us this morning. It was really, really our pleasure to have you with us and to read your thoughts. And, and, and the chat pods is really um, inspiring for us. So please uh, continue to participate with us. And make sure you fill out the survey link at the end of uh, the session here to make sure you get involved with the sketch credit. But on behalf of everyone in our unit and at the Michigan Department of Education, thank you for all your hard work that you do with students and educators to support their growth and well-being. We do appreciate all that you do out there every day. And please just know that here's our contact information. Please connect with us further to support our work. Michelle and myself, Joe Priest, we're really experts on the frameworks for educator evaluation. Uh, Rebecca is great with the district implementation and improvement. Uh, Brian is our student growth consultant that has, can really answer your data-rich questions. And Marty is really an expert on those uh, effectiveness ratings. So um, please reach out to us if you have questions around educator evaluations. We would love to be your partner in this work. Uh, have a great Friday, everyone. <laughs>